What happened to him? He refused to pay the national debt, and the church and the military dropped their support. So on January 23rd, 1958, he was overthrown. And from that moment on, 1958, Venezuela was able to reestablish democracy. We almost had 40 years of stable democracy and that was the beginning of a party system. We were able to have a strong democracy due to the Pacto Puerto Rico, uh, Punto Fijo, sorry, Pacto Punto Fijo, that it was signed in, night, in October of 1958. Um, and this is what Paula Osorio explains, this pact established the respect of the constitutionality of people's will expre express their vote. The militaries were submitted to the civil power, so they were not longer part of our political system. Um, they were politically excluded and expect to defend the people's democratic choice. They were there to protect people. Obviously, that's not what's happening right now. So this pact was signed by three political parties pretty much the main ones in Venezuela, Acción Democrática, AD, Comité de Organización Política Electoral, COPEI, and Unión Republicana Democrática, URD, URD. And one thing that they did, they left the Communist Party out of the pact. So you wonder, 1958, they signed the pact, and they excluded the Communist Party. <coughs> After 1958, there was peaceful periods of, oops, sorry, of um, elections and transfer of power. Um, oil brought political e economical stability. We have oil. The democratic system was working better. And during the 1970s and 80s, Venezuela experienced a source of great prosperity. And as I was telling, um, I don't remember, Kathy, that I think she lived in Venezuela and I lived in Venezuela when there was prosperity. That's why I always remember a great place because I didn't have to go through what people are going right now. Um, so in 1976, uh, Former uh, President Carlos Andres Perez um, nationalized the oil industry in Venezuela. Because before that, we have foreign investor, investments, investors, and foreign companies. And in 1976, it was time for Venezuela to take control of its oil. During Perez's first term in office, he was accused, accused of corruption. However, nothing was done. He was set free. A lot of people were mad, but nothing was done. Again, part of our system. By the end of February of 1992, Venezuela was in a deep economy crisis. And what happened? It was former President Luis Herrera Camping who spent Venezuela's international reserves. He devaluated the Bolivar in 1983, and I remember clearly that they always referred to El Viernes Negro, Black Friday. Not going shopping. <laughs> they, that was the first time the Bolivar was devaluated, so that always kept with me. They always referred to it, and I was like, hmm, interesting. I was like nine years old. <laughs> so in 1984, Jaime Lucinchi was elected president. Again, as you can see, after 1958, every five years we had elections. You know, everything was smooth. And all of the members from his cabinet, including him, were accused of corruption. All of them. Interesting. Even though Carlos Andres was accused of being corrupt, 
He ran as president for a second time. And what happened? He was elected. He came from the Andes state, and some of you, you know, you know, know about Merida. He was a gocho. And pretty much, I was talking to my husband, I said, most of the Venezuelan uh, presidents came from the Andes. And it's true, so this um, president um, was elected, and something really, really bad happened that he got a country that has economical problems, as, as politicals as well, political problems. So on February 16, 1989, he had to announce his neoliberal program with austerity measures by the IMF. Gas went up, everything went up, and people were not happy with all the measures he took. He did it for according to him, for, you know, to have a better economy. However, people were not happy. So I will never forget that day because that was 23 days later after I moved to the United States. And suddenly, that same day, my cousin was born. And we looked at the TV and we we're like, what's happening in Venezuela? So on February 27, El Caracaso happened in Venezuela. Um, the riots lasted five days, and up to these days, they don't know exactly how many people died. Some people say that 200, 2,000, but a lot of people died. And from that moment on, Venezuela changed. Um, there were riots, a lot of things were destroyed, stores, it was out of control. And at that time, the inflation was 80%. And you look at the, you know, it's funny because I was reading this and I say, oh, 80% in 89. And if we talk about what the inflation rate is right now, it's like almost 3,000. That was nothing. However, at that time, it was bad. So I was not able to be home. And to be honest with you, I didn't want to be there. But it was painful to look on TV what was happening. So. What happened in Venezuela after that, that I will never forget, and I was talking to you, Dave, about that, that on February 4th, 1992, Venezuelan democracy, one of the most stable democracy with Costa Rica, after almost three decades of nothing happening, there was a coup attempt by Hugo Chavez Frias. And I was in Venezuela. I went home and I stayed days extra, and believe me, I have never seen anything like that. I was really scared, and I looked at my grandma and said, what's going to happen? It's scary, you know. He was on national TV saying that he was going to overthrow the government, that he was not happy with what was happening, and so I was like, oh. So that same year, in November of, or November 27, 1992, he tried to attempt to overthrow Carlos Andres Perez for a second time. The rebels killed people. They were mad at the system. And what happened, even though it was bad, they started gaining public sympathy. Some people said, this is what we need. And so there was sympathy for the Boliv Bolivarian, Bolivarian Rep Revolutionary Movement led by Hugo Chavez Frias. <coughs> On May 20, 1993, Carlos Andres Perez was forced to resign and impeach. So nothing happened to him in the 70s. But in 1993, he had to resign because there were charges of embezzling more than 17 million from a secret account. A year later, he was arrested. So we had an interim uh, president at that time. And from that moment on, our political system changed. It was never the same. And the two main political parties that control Venezuela, Acción Democrática and COPEI, were not longer in control. 
In December of 1993, former President Rafael Caldera was elected president. During his government, we had the worst banking crisis in Venezuela history. There were a lot of banks that were closed. But he did something that changed our history. He was a very smart president, somebody who was admired, but he decided to release Hugo Chavez Frias from prison. Remember, he tried to overthrow the government twice, and of course, they exiled, they went to Peru, they went to different places, they came back to Venezuela. He was taken to prison, and then Caldera, and I don't know why, was maybe sad. To be honest with you, I don't understand, but he was released. From that moment on, Chavez had a goal in mind to run as a president. He wanted to be our president. And so six years after attempting, you know, to overthrow Carlos Andres twice. And let me tell you something that I thought it was interesting. Chavez was a man who came from humble bringings, upbringings. And he, you know, he earned his ways up as a military person. And when he graduated from military school, it was Carlos Andres Perez who gave him his diploma. And then a year later, he was the one who tried to overthrow him twice. And interesting, isn't it? He won the elections of 1998. And let me tell you something. In 1998, I was living in Kansas. And I will never forget that night. I cried and cried and cried because I didn't want Chavez to win. And my boyfriend, which is my husband at the time, said, you have to stop. And I say, my migraine is going to kill me. He said, I'm going to take you to the emergency. And he's like, let it go. I say, I cannot let it go because I know this is not going to be good for Venezuela. So in December, he won the elections. He, he got 56.20% against Enrique Sala Romer. He was you know, a businessman that only got 39% 0.97, and then Irene Saez, a Miss Universe who was loved in Venezuela. She did a good job. She was under, uh, she was in control of uh, El Chacao, the, the, the municipal place of Chacao, and they both lost to Chavez. So that is Chavez there. Can I, can I, I mean, people are not gonna hear me. Can I step, you know, when he was in military school, when he tried to attempt to overthrow and he was shown on TV, when he became president. And let me tell you something. Um, I went to school in Kansas to do my master's and I decided that my thesis was gonna be about Venezuela. And I said that I, was, I wanted to write about caudillos in Latin America and I wanted to compare Chavez with Fujimori, Peru and Venezuela. And one of the things I said was that Chavez eventually will become a dictator. Some of the people look at me like, you're studying politics and you don't know anything about politics? What a pity. I was like, well, that's what I believe. And so people thought I was crazy. No, I don't know. It, I, I always knew, I don't know how, but, and let me tell you one more thing. So I was in Venezuela and I didn't know that my mother's cousin, was the head of security of Chavez. He was in power, you know, he worked for the government for 20 years. So he was the head of security of Carlos Andres for two times, twice. He was the head of security of, of um, Luis Herrera Camping and all these presidents. And I was like, oh, amazing. I was invited to a cocktail at um, the military museum where Ch Chavez now is resting in peace. And I had the opportunity to meet him. And I will never forget, he was like, hola, buena moza, good looking, how are you? I'm like, oh, I'm doing well. And he's like, well, I heard that you come from the United States. And I say, yes, I live in the US. And I'm like, what do you think about Americans? He's like, you know what I think about Americans? You know what they did to me? I'm like, oh, what do they do to you? Well, they deny my visa. I cannot go to the US. I'm like, mm, interesting. And believe it or not, 
I had some issues with my F1 visa in Caracas. And the same person who denied Chavez visa was the same person who denied my visa. <laughs> so he said, you and I, we have something in common. And I say, yes. I was not happy to be there, but I say, you know, sometimes you have these opportunities that you cannot pass. So I was able to have a conversation with Chavez for five, 10 minutes. We took pictures and everything. And yes, the lady denied his visa, and so she did it for me. So he said, you know how the Americans are. I'm like, yes, I know how the Americans are. He had a different opinion of what the Americans are compared to me, because I love this country. I came here as a teenager, and I always say to people, everything I have gained in life has been here in the United States. But my heart is divided in two, half Venezuelan, half the US. So he was very nice. However, I didn't like him. <laughs> but when do you have the opportunity to meet presidents? Even um, Caldera, the guy who released him from prison, I had the opportunity to meet him. My family was involved in politics. They come from Copay, um, one of the biggest uh, political party in Venezuela. And so I had the opportunity to meet Caldera. So when I think about it, met Caldera, met Chavez. I don't want to meet Maduro, to be honest with you. <laughs> At least this guy, which I don't like or didn't like, was more charismatic than Maduro. He's a populist, and I will never forget what my mother's cousin, Carlos Alvarez, told me. He said, I'm retiring. I'm like, why? I cannot keep up with Chavez. I'm like, what's wrong with Chavez? He's crazy. He is a populist. He likes to get close to people. He likes to have that connection. And it's very stressful to be protecting him. So he did retire. Good for him. <laughs> so after you know, a year in power, Chavez came up with the idea, and this is something that not only he has done, but a lot of people in Latin America and other places, decided to replace the Constitution of 1962. Why? Well, we're going to replace it. We're going to rewrite a new one to make changes that are going to be good for whom? <laughs> for him, not for us. So with this new, skill, uh, this new Constitution, he prolonged his years in power and gave the military more power. And remember, going back to El Punto de Punto Fijo, they were supposed to have the military out of the political system life. They're there to protect the country's people, not to be part of the political system. So that's what he did. And of course, the military had the right to intervene in Venezuelan's people's life. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen that on TV lately. Um, he was president from February of 1999 until December of 2013. Um, in 2002, many Venezuelans were not happy with Chavez because a lot of people started thinking with the ties that he had with Fidel Castro. Let me tell you, Fidel Castro was his mentor. Chavez used to go to Cuba many, many times, even before he was in the political system. So people always thought, hmm, are we going to become Cuba? And of course, everybody said, oh, no, we're crazy. That will never happen in Venezuela. And I lived in Miami. And of course, I had the privilege or the experience to spend time with Cubans. You read about history, you learn about history, but it's not the same thing when you talk to these people, when you see what they go through. And I will never forget what the Cubans used to tell me there. I worked at a, an interpreting translation company, the biggest one in Miami, owned by a Cuban family. And most of the editors and people who worked at the company were Cubans. And they always said, oh, yeah, chica, mira, chica, hey, you, chica, hey, you, girl, go to Venezuela now while you can, because you're not going to be able to go back. And I was like, what? They say, believe it or not, you guys will be the second Cuba of Latin America. This was in 2002. Were these people wrong? No. Some of the people that I worked with, they were 
They were in prison. They were tortured and everything. So they went through everything. And they told me, go now, enjoy it. Because it will get to a point that you will not go in anymore. And if I go in, I will never come out. I became a U.S. citizen, but now the Venezuelan government requires you to have a visa for, in the case of my kids, but in my case, I will have to have a Venezuelan passport. We have dual nationality, but I enter Venezuela as a U.S. citizen. Do you think they treated me the same? They treated me really bad, and they're always like, I can send you back, and let me remind you that you're not American, you're Venezuelan. And I say, let me remind you that in your embassies or consulates, you never have the material to get a Venezuelan passport. And you that come from Miami, I say, because my plane arrived from Miami, that doesn't mean that I live in Miami. So please, treat me with respect. I deserve that. And I am a Venezuelan citizen. And so they treated my, me bad, and they tell you things. And I say, I left this country before everything happened. And that was my right. So, going back to this, a lot of people thought we're going to become Cuban, Cuban, Cuba, and then he started passing laws that affected a lot of people. He didn't like the press. Of course not, because they will say exactly what he was saying. And Chavez was different. Chavez could talk on TV for 10 hours. Imagine that. And he was crazy. He's like in the middle of like broadcasting. Can I have some water, please? And then he will hey, like, hey, you with it, you know. It was like he was not the typical political person that we were used to in Venezuela. So imagine talking on TV for 10 hours. So a lot of people were not happy with what he was doing. So he was um, helping and working with Iraq, Iran, and Syria. And he has always been, he was always open against the US. He had all these nicknames, all these names, that I was like, please. Um, in, on April of 11, 2002, there was a coup of 10 attempt against Chavez. Believe it or not, I lived in Miami. I was so happy. I jumped. I cried. I hugged all my friends. But the happy time were over three days later. He came back to power. Some people have said that what they did was kind of like a strategy. They wanted to see who was against Chavez to get rid of them. So he came back in three days. That was hopeful. Um, things were bad. From that moment on, they started the fight with the opposition. Um, in December of 2002, the opposition started a national strike to have Chavez resign. Of course, he didn't resign. It lasted until February 2003. And from that moment on, things became ugly because Chavez said on national TV, we went on a strike, we lost a lot of money, we didn't produce anything. PDVSA, um, the main oil company of Venezuela, lost 35,000 employees that were qualified. And then he brought his people. And he said, now you're going to you're gonna learn to do tourism here in Venezuela. No more money for you. So he established a foreign exchange system that up to this day, I don't understand, but they did it to control people. So in order for you to get money, you needed to fill out an application online and go to the banks and ask the government to give you your own money. So they started with 5,000 and then went down 3,000, 4,000, and at this point, you don't get anything. So um, after the, you know, the coup attempt, he became more popular, he was more powerful. Him and Fidel Castro created what is called El Alba, it's a block where they're helping political, social, and economic integration in Latin America. They felt that some of these countries were rejected or forgotten by, you know, the US. The US is the enemy. So now, you know, Bolivar had a dream of having La Gran Colombia. 
all of these countries becoming one. So that didn't happen. And so Chavez always thought that he was Simon Bolivar. And believe me, because I knew some people in the government, they say that at Chavez table, he had a share reserved for Bolivar. He was obsessed with Bolivar. He thought he was Bolivar. Some of his followers believe that he is, but I think the majority of Venezuelans know that there was only one Bolivar. So anyway, so you know, he did that with Fidel Castro, and then they crea created Petro Caribe in 2005, so pretty much to help these countries with energy and with oil. Venezuela was, is selling uh, some of these countries oil for lower prices, helping them do an exchange and so they thought by doing that, they were going to get rid of the United States. During his years in power, he implemented his own political ideology with the Bolivarian Revolution and created the term socialismo of El Siglo XXI, socialism of 21th century. And according to Dietri, who is um, a German, a, soci a sociologist, a German sociologist, worked closely with Chavez. And so pretty much, um, he says, socialism of the 21st century argues that both free market, industrial capitalism, and 20th century socialism have failed to solve urgent problems of humanity, like poverty, hunger, exploitation, economic oppression, sexism, racism, the destruction of natural resources, and the absence of truly participated, participant democracy. So what did Chavez do? In 2006, he came up with this term, and he wanted to change everything. And so he nationalized key industries in the telecommunication, oil, and electricity sectors. And this is kind of scary. According to the Venezuelan Industrial Confederation, during Chavez's 13 years in power, there were 12, uh, 1,200 business expropriated by him. And it was funny. I remember seeing Chavez on TV, and he would be, expropialo. And people were laughing, yeah. I was like, how can you be happy by destroying the economy? But everybody thought it was, it was cute, it was beautiful. He was our hero. He saved us. And I was like, OK, interesting. So the former president had rejections against private enterprise. He did not like private enterprise. So after Chavez took over, almost 60% of, 60 of foreign enterprises left Venezuela because they felt that if they didn't live, they were going to be stuck with their companies taken away. And even some of the companies that stay in Venezuela are still waiting for Venezuela to pay how much. They owed, if I tell you all the money they owed, it's like I would be here hours and hours. So that's what happened. A lot of people start leaving. Do I blame them? Of course not. You have to be smart. It's your business. It's your money. But some of these companies didn't want to live. They were in Venezuela for so many years, but they didn't have another option. So this is one of the things that I like. In many occasions, Chavez declared, ser rico es malo, which means being rich is bad. OK, so according to El Diario Las Americas, they reported that Chavez's favorite daughter, Gabriela Chavez, has assets of totally nearly $4.2 billion. What do you think about that? <laughs> she has more money than the biggest uh, then the two, there's two guys in Venezuela, Cisnero, who comes from Cuban descent, and um, the owner of one of the biggest companies in Venezuela, Polar, that these people have been in, you know, huh? Yeah, la, la, yes, the beer company, but now they own so many companies. This girl has more money than they do. Chavez was poor. Bolivar was, came from, Simon Bolivar, liberator, came from you know, a wealthy background. And when he died, he was poor. The opposite of Chavez. Chavez came poor, died a millionaire. And his daughter, look at that, the richest person in Venezuela. Isn't that ironic? Oh, Dios mío. For the majority of Venezuelans, Hugo Chavez Ria was a hero, not me. 
I have always stated that I never voted for Chavez. Never in my life. He was charismatic, yes, and like I told you, I had the opportunity to meet him. I was sitting there, I heard him talk, and he was, he attracted people. He was a populist. He had that characteristic in him. He did care. He cared about the poor, which nothing wrong with that, but I think what happens, he got lost. Went to Cuba, was very authoritarian, and did not respect people's privacy or properties or anything. He had a connection with people. It, was, it is amazing to see how many Venezuelans' families have become enemies because of Chavez. Either you're Chavista or you are Escualido. Either you're Chavista or you're from the opposition. So it was funny because people in Venezuela who wears red are part of the government. So if you're not Chavista, you should not wear red. So my mother came to visit and I say, she's like, oh, I need to buy a suitcase. And I say, oh, this beautiful red suitcase. She said, are you crazy? How can I take that back to Venezuela? I say, there's nothing wrong. She's like, they're gonna think I'm Chavista. My mother was crazy. I remember walking downtown with her and she would say, I'm gonna start screaming that he's crazy and that. And I say, listen, you let me know when you're gonna start doing that because I'm gonna be far away. <laughs> if you said anything against Chavez in Venezuela, they would do, you wouldn't imagine what they would do to you. These people became violent. He was like, Jesus. I'm like, there's only one Jesus and not, that wasn't Chavez. So you have to be careful with the things you said about him. But it was sad to see that in a family gathering, you were always tense because you have the Chavista side and you have the opposition and you knew that as soon as they started talking, what was gonna happen? The fun was over. He did that to my country. He created that separation that we never had. Even though we have these two political parties that they exchange power every five years, people were decent to each other. With Chavismo, mm-mm. Oh, Dios. Okay, so during his years in powers, like I told you, with Venezuela, we have the highest reserve of oil in the world, which is great, but they haven't done a good job managing that. So. During the time he came to power, the oil barrel was $13 in 1999. During those years after that, the price of the barrel kind of like fluctuated, changed. It went from 100 to 130. So Chavez had money. The money that we have never seen in history, he had it. So this is what they say, he produced a trillion dollars during those years he was in power. And we don't have any food right now? Where's the money? And that was Chavez. He was throwing money, he was buying everybody off. He became the hero of Latin America. He who was helping everybody, which was, they thought it was great. And even though we have all those many, you know, all, all those oil boons in history, he knew how to distribute money, but he didn't do anything about what are we gonna do with the economy? We have depend heavily on oil, which is not good. You cannot depel, depend on one thing. You have to depend on many sectors of your economy. So Venezuela right now doesn't produce anything because we depend heavily on oil. So he gets to power, the barrel was 13, it went up to 130, they had money. That changed because in 2014, the price of oil went down. So whenever price, the, the, whenever you see uh, oil price here low, that is affecting Venezuela. When it's high, you know that Venezuela is getting money. So um, he died of cancer at the age of 58, and he wanted Maduro, his vice president, to become the new president of Venezuela. Maduro was the interim president for a short period of time. They had elections which of course he won because they win all the elections. That's one of the things that a typical Caldillo will do. And Maduro studied in Cuba. Maduro, as a member of the Super Socialist League, he was a bus driver, he was a member of the National Assembly, 
and he served as a foreign minister for Chavez during seven years. Maduro is nothing like Chavez. He's not charismatic. People, if I tell you the adjectives that they use to describe him, they're not proper to use here. <laughs> um, he's not doing anything to help the crisis. Um, according to Maduro, and I will read this really quick, Venezuelan's problems are the result of the economic welfare weighed by the US. Everything that happens in Venezuelan soil is US fault. But, but this is, 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 it makes me sick. Former foreign minister and top aide Delcy Rodriguez has denied that the country has a food crisis, denouncing the blackmail of hunger. She told the new legislator super body, in Venezuela there's no hunger. And that's what they do. These people will stay on TV and say, everything is beautiful here which is a beautiful country, but people are starving to death. People don't have medicine. So um, there's malnutrition. Kids are, uh, you know, they're at risk. Last week I was watching a video and I started crying. And a mother and a human being, I'm Venezuelan, and when I see little kids crying and dying, it's like, why? It breaks my heart. They, the Catholic Church, the opposition, and everybody have tried to ask them to open ways of getting humanitarian aid. They do not want it. And people have lost nine pounds per year. Um, we have the highest inflation. If I tell you all of the records Venezuela has right now, you will cry. Because we have the highest inflation. Caracas is the most dangerous city in the world. We don't have. Uh, there's no quality of life in Venezuela. And the IMF is saying that by the year 2018, you know, the economy is going to contract 6%. Unemployment will be 30%. So everything looks dark for Venezuela. There's no medicine. There's no food. There's nothing. So and, and what do they do? They repress people. They kill people. They don't respect people's privacy. You can only go to the supermarket when they tell you to do that. If you, it's not your day, you cannot. And one thing I always tell my students and I tell my daughters, don't complain to me about food. Ah, uh, there's nothing to eat, mommy. I'm like, come on. When I know for a fact that a lot of people, not only in Venezuela, but in the world are dying because they don't have food. We take it for granted. I always believe that. Sometimes we don't know what we get ourselves into, and I think Venezuela learned the hard way. We have two political parties that we hate it, we complain about it, but nothing like the Chavismo. 17 years in power, they don't want to give up. They're considered the biggest narco state in Venezuelan history. And to be honest with you, as a Venezuelan, I pray to God as a Catholic every day that something good is going to happen. But I don't know what to believe anymore. My husband has said, I don't want to hear anything about Venezuela. Because he's mad, you know. And, 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 and I will conclude that it's sad to see how many politicians are out there telling the people that we're going to change. And they're working with the government behind the door. Pretty much the whole system is corrupt. And I hope that. The new generations will do something because everybody's leaving Venezuela. And how can you not leave Venezuela when there's no food, electricity, water, basic necessities? We're not asking the Venezuelan government to give people luxury. We're asking the Venezuelan government to provide basic necessities. And that is the right to do. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's, Ch Chavez and Trump, both populists, both pro-military. In the news recently, President Trump wants to give the military more power to act without the approval of Congress. Should Americans be concerned? Let me tell you something. When I saw uh, Trump, I said, this is the Venezuelan Trump. Trump is like the Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. That's what I thought. Kind of crazy. He's an outsider. And that's what I say. Venezuela wanted an outsider, somebody who didn't know anything. And that's pretty much what's happening here with Trump. And let me tell you, I had the opportunity to meet Trump, too. So I've been blessed to meet all these presidents that maybe, I don't know if people are too happy about it, but I had the opportunity. And I, I, I don't know. I have told people, I said, when I look at Trump, it reminds me of Chavez. 
He doesn't like the press, you know. It's all these crazy things that I'm like, please. This is like deja vu again for me. I want this country to keep prospering. I don't want anything bad happening after you see what Venezuela has gone through. I don't want any country in the world to go through what Venezuela has gone through. And of course, China has gone through that, Russia has gone through that, Cuba has gone through that. But you hope that you want your country to be better. So it's kind of scary, to be honest with you. It reminds me of Chavez. <laughs> I, I don't know if he's Chavez or not, but. So this, this is a question I, I, it occurred to me too. Do, do you have any idea for how to address the, the, the crisis? Uh, and then it says past politicians admitting there's a problem. What, what do you think the future, I mean, what's gonna happen? To be honest, I think something that is happening right now is that they wanna start from zero. They don't wanna refer to these old political parties. They wanna start with new, like young people that have new ideas. And I think that's what they're gonna do. And I had a picture here of these three people. Luis Almagro, He's the, uh, the president of the OEAS Association, who is from Uruguay, and I believe that he's more Venezuelan than all of these people. And then we have Maria Corina Machado and um, Antonio Ledesma, who were both part of the political uh, process in Venezuela. He's in prison, but at home. And she, was the, she has been the only woman who has stand to Chavez and said, what you're doing is wrong. You're crazy and imagine. Um, they want to they wanna start something new. If you want your country to change, you have to f forget what happened in the past, especially since we had elections in October, not, you know, like two weeks ago, and everything was like planned. How can you trust politicians when you're telling the people of Venezuela that we care for you, and four minutes later, you're sitting with Maduro. There has to be a new era, new political parties, new ideologies for the sake of Venezuela. Thank you. Please uh, join me in thanking America for her presentation. I want to thank our sponsors, the University of Iowa's International Programs, University of Iowa's Honors Program, University of Iowa Public Policy Center and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their support. And today's special sponsors, Joe Wegman, David Rust, and Joy Smith. And we thank City Channel 4 for making these programs available to viewing audiences. And America, as a token of our appreciation, we would like to present you with our coveted uh, Foreign Relations Council mug. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. For my we Venezuelan coffee. <laughs> <laughs> thank you.